thank you everyone and uh, very happy to be here. Uh, as Patrick said, uh, the goal here will be to give you a bit of a snapshot uh, of the things that the Purdue team has been working on over the past five years. Um, there are a couple of uh, reprints of articles uh, in the lounge and I would suggest that if you're interested in the topics in greater detail, you either pick up a copy or you uh, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to provide one. I borrowed my subtitle from uh, a talk that uh, Jerry Berman gave in 1998. Some of you may know uh, uh, Jerry Berman. And his talk was Income and Nutrition uh, Tightly Wedded or Loosely Meshed. And I thought that it was a, a good subtitle for uh, the kinds of work that we're doing on climate, nutrition, and agriculture. And I guess the, uh, the point that I would like to make is that in some particular circumstances, the connections between these uh, three domains is very tightly wedded, um, but in some cases loosely meshed. And so we'll, we'll explore that. As a way of truth in advertising, I would like to point out that although we're using climate here in the title, um, most of what I'm going to be talking about and most of what we can actually observe and measure uh, con constitutes weather. And in particular, we're talking about growing conditions as observed um, and in some cases, rainfall and temperature. So I want to begin with uh, some distributions of z-scores. Uh, these are z-scores from Uganda and Nepal for height for age and weight for height. They come from the 2006 and 2011 DHS surveys. Many of you are familiar with those. Um, and part of what the, uh, the Purdue team has been working on these past five years is uh, generating a better understanding of what um, is the driving force behind some characteristics of these z-score diagrams. Now, if we, we think about uh, child nutrition outcomes, there are a lot of different ways that we can think about it. We can, we can consider and perhaps ask the question, why is it that we find some children on the right side of the distribution and others on the left? Why is it that we find some distributions for subpopulations that are moved one direction or the other? And we can even ask, in the case of Nepal and Uganda, uh, why is it or what factors help us understand why these distributions overall have moved to the right over time, as indeed they have, okay? moving a very large number of children um, across thresholds of concern. So I'm going to say something that, that may be considered provocative. Uh, I hope it'll promote discussion as the day goes on. Um, we've spent a lot of time studying these distributions, trying to understand all of the factors that may be uh, contributing to z-score and nutrition outcomes in children. And I've, I've sort of put my mind around it and thought that in it all boils down to a kind of 50-25-25 rule. And my 50-25-25 rule is that about 50% of the explanation that you might be looking for can be found at the level of the child and the mother. And about 25% of the explanatory power, whether you're looking at individual children or you're looking at large groups of the population, can be found at the household level. And that remaining 25%, the explanation can be found sort of at the context in which households operate. So the market context, the environmental context, uh, the infrastructure context. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that all policy should be designed with this 50, 25, 25 rule in mind, but I think as a way of motivating our thinking about intervention and policy design, it makes sense for us to move away from thinking that there may be a silver bullet and rather thinking that we have to have a package of interventions and that in these rough proportions they may help in contributing to nutrition improvements. A lot of the work that uh, we've been doing involves partners at NASA and the work that we've been doing seeks to connect satellite remotely sensed data on vegetation and vegetative health to child nutrition outcomes as I just showed you. Um, this diagram kind of gives you a schematic of the, the uh, 
the logistical uh, apparatus that we're using. Uh, there's a picture of the, the NASA satellite on the left on the, just taking off from the launch pad. NASA has a satellite that orbits the Earth and measures green vegetation at the Earth's surface. And we have a large historical database of these observations that we can link to child nutrition outcomes. And we can ask questions, for example, from DHS surveys about um, things that might have happened in the child's recent past, if we're interested in short-term short -term measures like wasting, or indeed things that might have happened in the child's long-term past, if we're inter interested in stunting. So, for example, we can take an individual child and match that child on a time period, but also match that child across space and across agronomic conditions to begin to ask questions like, what were the growing conditions like when that child was in utero? Or what were the growing conditions like when that child was being weaned? And so we can begin to understand something about the agricultural landscape and how that might be contributing to observe nutrition outcomes. If we do that, um, we get some signal out of the data. This, uh, this illustrates data from Nepal where we have um, growing conditions, greenness moving to the right, and the weight for height z-scores of children on the y-axis. And uh, the first panel is the observed greenness during the most, gre most recent growing period, and the right panel is the greenness during the most recent month. Okay? And in both cases, we see a fairly robust positive correlation between greenness, as we might expect, and short-term indicator, indicators of nutrition. Okay? Now, that's uh, fine and good. Uh, one might ask from a policy perspective, what can we do with that information? Um, certainly, things that contribute to agricultural productivity in a very general way would be expected to be correlated with improvements in child growth. Maybe not in every instance and in every circumstance, but on average, that kind of policy would be associated with improvements in child nutrition outcomes. Greening the landscape, if you will. Uh, a second aspect of this that's of interest and it'll take me a, just a couple of minutes to describe this diagram, uh, is to ask about what happens in particular microenvironments or in particular settings where households may be quite isolated from the kinds of infrastructure that promotes health and nutrition. So we might think about roads and bridges in the case of Nepal. We might think about health facilities, clinics, nurses, doctors. We might think about agricultural markets um, and things like that. So what I've <coughs> diagrammed here on the x-axis is an indicator of uh, departures from normality, as the satellite informs us. So the satellite is telling us something about how, over time, a particular environment might look. And we're asking the question, how does that depart from normality? So the center of the diagram is normal. And then as we move on either side, we're either getting more wet, more green, or less wet, less green. And then on the y-axis, I have an indicator for height for HZ. And we've traced out two lines here. The first line is that relationship for children who live in the mountain zone of Nepal, typically an area where children are isolated from infrastructure, infra isolated from irrigation facilities, isolated from agricultural markets. And the upper line, the green line, is for children from the Terai, okay? And the thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that environmental variability affects children in a very heterogeneous way, right? It depends a lot on the kinds of infrastructure that surround a child and the kinds of agriculture that's being um, conducted in that environment um, and depends uh, on what kinds of shocks those, those environments might receive. So down here in the mountain zone, what we observe in the data is that when you have a departure from normality, normal growing conditions, it's quite deleterious to child nutrition outcomes. 
in both directions. In other words, these children are quite sensitive to the environment, presumably because agriculture is quite sensitive to environmental conditions. And so these children are more vulnerable to changes in uh, environmental conditions than children in the Terai. And we might, as the day goes on, talk about why that might be the case, um, sp speculate and actually look at the data to understand why that might be the case. In the Terai, uh, there's greater access to irrigation, there's greater access to markets, there's better infrastructure um, in the health community, right? And all of those things tend to buffer children from environmental shocks. And so I think that's a really important policy lesson that we can think about all of the kinds of infrastructure that wraps around children as a way of buffering those children from the vagaries of rainfall and, and uh, weather. Okay. So I want to show you one more slide, one more picture, and then uh, we'll kind of conclude with a few bullet points. Uh, I'm going to shift attention from Nepal to Uganda, and I'm going to shift attention from the natural environment to the market environment. Because another thing that we're trying uh, to understand is how market forces might also affect child nutrition outcomes. Now, in this graph, I'm not going to show you any nutrition data. Uh, I'm going to show you some agricultural price data. And it'll take me just a, a minute to set this up. Some of you, at some point in your training, might have been asked to solve a linear programming problem for uh, an optimal diet. So if you remember that thought exercise, the, the question is if you have a basket of goods available to you and you can choose those and they each have a cost associated with them, what's the cheapest way to assemble the best diet? A diet that meets a certain set of nutrient requirements. So what we've done in Uganda is we've gone out and collected uh, uh, several decades of agricultural price data from markets, uh, monthly data, and we've solved that problem, that nutrition uh, diet problem, for uh, five different locations around Uganda, asking the question, if you could choose the optimal diet based on prices that you see in the marketplace, if you could choose from a basket of 10 commodities to meet 14 macro and micronutrient requirements, what would the cost of that diet be? And as you can see, that diet cost fluctuates over time. It's fluctuated quite a bit. It's become much more variable in recent years in Uganda. Um, but the, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is that if you draw the poverty line for Uganda, here it's $1.25 per day. I understand that the World Bank is talking about revising that upward. But at the moment, if you look at the $1.25 per day poverty line, uh, it's pretty clear that the cost of diet is inaccessible. It exceeds that poverty line uh, in many, many cases. Right? Now, that doesn't mean it's inaccessible to everyone. In fact, if you actually go out and you look at the population weights and, and calculate the number of people who might be exposed to these kinds of prices, and you think about what their incomes are, you find that about 50% of Ugandans couldn't access a nutritionally adequate diet. Okay. Now, what's the take-home message there? Well, first of all, prices matter, and a lot of us focus on prices. But of course, because the poverty line's here, you would argue that incomes matter as well. Um, but more importantly, I think that the solution to this diet problem requires that we have a basket of goods that provide nutrients and that individuals know something about how to assemble those, those foods in the most optimal fashion, right? So we can take this economic story about prices and the cost of diet, but it has a very relevant, I think, policy, uh, very policy relevant implication uh, in the context of nutrition education and accessibility in the marketplace and at home. Thank you.